Breaking news tonight, haunting video emerges of an LSU beauty, Maddie Brooks, barely able to speak or stand after three men sex assault her in a car's back seat while the driver, may he rot in hell, videos the whole attack and at least one perp can be heard laughing. Then they leave Maddie on an empty street where she's immediately mowed down by another driver. Bombshell tonight, we learn the female judge who's presiding over this case has a son who's a convicted serial rapist. And this is the same judge who lets one rapist after the next walk free. And I am telling you tonight, this is not justice. Good evening, I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us. Now, it gets to around 1.50 a.m. By this point, Maddie is drunk. She's been seen falling inside the bar, falling outside the bar. But she and these four men decide to leave the bar. They walk to a vehicle that's being driven by Kaysen Carver. They leave Reggie's. They drive a short distance where they pull over. Kaysen Carver, 18, takes several videos from the driver's seat narrating what's happening while Madison Brooks is in the back seat of his car. In one selfie video, Carver yells, These guys are crazy. They finna rape her. In another, Brooks can be heard shouting, Get off me! over loud music. Several videos taken outside the car show KV and Washington pushing Brooks down against the seat. Desmond Carver is seen with his pants down, appearing to penetrate Brooks while the other men cheer. Guys, you are seeing video first given to WBRZ by the defense. Uh, the video given to WAFB by uh, the defense. And somehow they think that's going to help them? No way. Guys, with me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. But the bombshell that the judge sitting on this case, presiding on this case, has a son, and I would like, there she is, has a son, which is hard for me to believe this, who she actually represented in a serial rape case. And he got decades behind bars. She did everything she could to save him, but... It didn't work, and now she's letting one rapist after the next off. I want to go back to what happened the night this beautiful young girl, her whole life in front of her. What happened that night? Joining me is her mother, who I now consider to be a friend, Ashley Bostert. But listen to this. It's how she was essentially dumped on the side of the road after what they're claiming was a consensual ride. In the middle of the night, in the rain, heavy traffic flying by, they put her out of the car, and bam, she gets run over and dies after she gets raped. That's what the state says. That's not how someone who was part of a consensual sexual escapade is treated. That's how a victim is re-victimized and thrown out like garbage. After a long night of drinking, Maddie Brooks, 19, leaves Reggie's bar with four young men who offer to give her a ride home. A few blocks from the bar, the driver pulls over and starts videoing as the two men in the back seat have sex with an extremely intoxicated Brooks. Afterwards, Brooks is unable to tell the men her address and, according to them, insists on getting out of the car. Just before 3 a.m., a Lyft driver strikes something in the road. It's Maddie Brooks, who dies of her injuries at a hospital. I don't believe one bit of this video given to WBRZ by the defense and to WAFB by the defense, and somehow they believe that's going to help them. Before I get on this judge who has let one rapist after the next walk free, I want to go to Ashley Bostert. Ashley, I do not know how you put one foot in front of the other 
I know you are dedicated to raising your other children, but if you would, I'd like to take you back to that night that you learned your girl, Maddie, was in the hospital. What happened? Oh, it was a complete nightmare. Um, I got a call from the hospital stating that she was in critical condition. They didn't tell me um, a lot of information. I had my parents drive me there because I knew that I wouldn't be able to safely drive myself to the hospital. And immediately when I saw her, I knew that something terrible had happened and that she was, she was with our Lord in heaven. So it, it's been a complete nightmare. The worst possible thing that can happen to anyone happened to my daughter. And not only was she my daughter, but she was my best friend. We did everything together. The best memories I have are spent being her mother. And that's what I have to hold on to every day. That's what gets me out of bed. I'm trying to live as well as I can until I'm reuni reunited with her in heaven. Ashley, everything that you just said echoes what I feel in my heart. And I think a lot of mothers feel the same way when I am upset or distressed or even can't sleep. It's like a movie plays in my head of all these wonderful times I've had with John, David, and Lucy, my children. And it, the best years of my life have been the years that I've had with them. You said that that night you went to the hospital and I know that Maddie was still alive when you got there because mm -hmm. you've told me that in the past, but you believe, as you say, she had gone on to our Lord. Why do you say that? Well, they told me immediately that she was brain dead. So they were keeping her alive. They were keeping her heart beating and pumping her with all different types of medication just to save her organs so that she could be a donor. And we were also waiting for her dad to travel from Florida to be at the hospital. So Maddie was there and she was breathing, but she was, she was not there. Do you think at any point she came to and knew you were there? I felt her there and I, I knew that something terrible had happened and it was going to be my mission to fight for her and to honor her and her legacy by helping others, which is what we are trying to do through her foundation. With me is Maddie's mother, Ashley Bostert. Ashley, when you got to the hospital and you were rushed to her room. Did she even look like herself? No, no. She was extremely swollen. There was tons of blood um, leaking out of her body. She did not, she was a very tiny, petite little girl. She was five one, maybe a hundred pounds. Um, and I could tell that it was her, but it definitely, she did not look the same. What did I she could hold like? her hands. I could hold her hands, but I didn't want to look at anything else. I didn't want that image to be in my head. I wanted to remember her the way that she was. You know, though, Ashley, um, I never saw my fiance's body after he was murdered. Mm -hmm. At the time, I thought that's what I wanted. And sometimes I, I wish that I had, because for the longest time, I couldn't accept that he had been killed. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I'm just a trial lawyer. I don't, I don't know what's right or wrong. Tell me when you learned what had happened. Mm -hmm. I suspected 
everything that had happened, I suspected just based on the circumstance, the time of day, the fact that she was alone without her cell phone, that something terrible had happened. And I guess about a week or so after the accident, the detectives brought us in and told us more of what they had learned through their investigation. I had to leave the room. Honestly, I fell to my knees. What do you mean? I just fell to my knees. It was a nightmare. I mean, an absolute nightmare. Which part of what happened to Maddie, after all you had been through, after you had buried your girl, which part of this scenario made you fall to your knees? The last few seconds of her life and what transpired. But I do hold on to the fact that the people that were in that vehicle are not the last people that were with her. I know that God sent those two guardian angels to be with her, to protect her, to pray over her. And those are the last two people that were with her. And that does give me some peace. Ashley, I feel that I know you because we've talked so much. And I know your disposition, and I know how much this case means to you. So I doubt, knowing you, that you're going to answer this question. But Ashley Bostert, what do you think about a lady judge that represented her son, who is a serial rapist, and I've got State v. Taylor in my hand. I've poured over every word of what her son did, and it's not in question because he pled guilty. And before pleading guilty, I have read the transcript. The prosecutor gave a rendition of what he did, and he agreed that's what he did. And his mother, who is now a judge, was representing him on that guilty plea, a serial rapist who attacks multiple teen girls in the night wearing a mask, in one case, wearing a monkey mask who sneaks into the girls' room, holds a sheet against their mouth, either brandishes a knife or a gun, and repeatedly rapes them, threatening he will kill them if they scream. After this, after representing her son, trying to get him a good sentence on serial rape, she is now letting one rapist go free after the next. That is a fact in writing. I've read the court proceedings myself. How do you feel about this woman presiding over the men that the state says raped your daughter? I can't comment on the judge. Ashley, it gives me no joy in saying any of the things that I am saying tonight, but they are true. And I know you and I know you will not speak against the judge. Joining me, in addition to Maddie's mother, Ashley, who is working tirelessly on the Maddie Brooks Foundation. Kieran Chala is joining me out of Baton Rouge, Emmy and Murrow Award winning investigative reporter and star of Unfiltered with Kieran.com. Kieran, thank you for being with us. Thanks for I know me. that you are investigating a much wider concern about judges letting rapists walk free, but could you just give me, in a nutshell, what this judge has done? So I think the most glaring part here is going to be that there was a guy who was convicted 
1972 for a deed for a rape and 50 years he was given actually she vacated the um, sentence but he was given life for rape so he goes before a judge and asks for a reduced sentence because he wants parole instead she ended up pretty much saying okay you're free to go you can't do that the district attorney here is absolutely livid that he's never heard of such a thing and that the suspect did not go before her asking to get rid of his sentence completely and there's a process for that you have to go before the parole board you need to go the governor can pardon somebody a judge cannot sit here and go simply say you're done you he went before the judge to ask for a reduced sentence and that's so it. he goes before the judge on something completely different and the judge cuts him free lets a rapist walk free and nobody even asked her to guys this is a tip of the iceberg and i want this judge off this case she's not fit to preside over this rape case or any other case the videos that case and carver took the night of maddie brooks alleged assault have resulted in more charges for the teen a grand jury indicted carver for video voyeurism in addition to the charge of principal to first and third degree rape in one of the videos carver laughed and said they finna rape her before brooks was assaulted these four men have been charged in this case, two of them with third degree rape. The other two, the two who were in the front seat of the vehicle, they have been charged with principle to third degree rape, which means that they were present for the alleged crime, but they did nothing to stop it. The question is, was Madison Brooks raped before she died? And did any of these events that led up to her death cause it? Many are concerned that District Judge Gail Horn Ray will not remain neutral while presiding over the trial of Madison Brooks' four alleged rapists. Last year, Judge Ray reduced an accused rapist bail without allowing prosecutors to argue against the decision. Just last month, Ray moved to overturn a 1972 rape conviction when asked to consider allowing the convict parole. Her son, Nelson Taylor Jr., is also a convicted serial rapist. Okay. Why is the judge so soft on rape cases? I think I know why. Listen. Nelson Taylor Jr., the 17-year-old son of now Judge Gail Horn Rape, is charged with one count of forcible rape, two counts of aggravated rape, and five counts of aggravated burglary. Taylor breaks into six homes over six months with the intent to rape teen girls sleeping inside. Victims describe a man in a mask who threatens them with a knife and uses tape to cover their eyes and mouths. Taylor is connected to the six crimes through DNA and fingerprints. Detectives say seven of Taylor's nine victims are students at his high school. Hold on just a moment. Let me go out to Jarrett Ferentino, a high-profile lawyer, former homicide and felony prosecutor, host of True Crime Boss podcast at JarrettFerentino.com. Jarrett, let me just read something for you. Now, I'm reading from the court of Appeals of Louisiana, okay, and I want to circle back to you because I believe the current case should be a felony murder case. A death occurred during the commission of a felony, that felony being rape, Maddie is dead. Two plus two equals four. That's a felony murder. I don't know what the hey this prosecutor's thinking, uh, but that said, I want you to listen to what I read over these weeks of preparing. Six rapes, the judge's son had six rapes. He's convicted of six rapes. Regarding counts one and two, a 15-year-old girl awakened in her bedroom by the presence of an unknown assailant wearing a mask, wearing a mask. Regarding count three, a 17-year-old girl was awakened in her bedroom by the presence of an unknown assailant wearing a monkey mask. Can you imagine a little teen girl? Oh, yeah, he had to change masks, Jarrett Ferentino, because he stupidly left the other mask on the crime scene. So he had to go get a mask. What did he pick? A monkey mask. Have you ever seen those movies where the assailants are wearing, like, pig masks or monkey masks or some kind of an animal mask? They're terrifying to a victim. And a young girl wakes up with seemingly a monster on top of her. The assailant straddles the girl. She screams. He told her to shut up, puts the sheet into her mouth to keep her quiet. 
It goes on and on and on. One has a knife, one has a gun, uh, mailing tape. It, th this is her son that she fought valiantly to be treated as a juvenile to get uh, five years probation in juvie jail. And now she is sitting on rape cases, letting one after the next walk free Ferentino. Nancy, it's very concerning. Um, there's a pattern with her son and there's a pattern with her. It's the air of impropriety. It's the smell of a conflict. It's the very crime before her. She defended her son who should be facing and serving a life sentence. She let a life inmate go free and it wasn't even his prayer for relief asking for a break. So this judge needs to step aside for all the young victims that her son had and for Maddie and her case, for Madison and her case. The, the air of conflict of interest here is too strong. I am sure she has many cases on her docket that can keep her plenty busy. Go to a judge whose son was not a serial rapist that she defended and got a break. It's that simple. And I'm sure there's plenty of other capable judges. And it's judges not just the son, Farentino, as you're pointing out. There are multiple other rapists that I know of. How many are there that I don't know about? I'm in a completely different jurisdiction, thousands of miles away, and even I know this. What else is there that has not been uncovered yet? In addition to Maddie's mom with us, who is refusing to comment on the judge. Joining us, Dr. Jeff Kalashevsky, forensic psychologist, author of Dark Sides. Dr. Kalashevsky, what is it about not just a mask where, you know, like Zorro has just his eyes covered up, but I mean a full-on pig mask or a monkey mask or animal mask. Why does that strike so much fear in a victim's heart? Well, it definitely strikes fear because it's obviously unusual. It's shocking. But I think what's more important to point out is when someone utilizes a mask, particularly in the middle of a sexual assault, uh, their payoff for the behavior that they're engaging in is beyond just a sexual act. The fear and intimidation, seeing the fear in the victim's face, these are all things that sort of satisfy that appetite for the violent act of rape that you talked about earlier. This young girl, stunning, so full of life. I've seen videos of Maddie, and she is bubbling with the joy of life. Just so smart, the whole world in front of her. But after a horrific rape, not one, not two, but according to prosecutors, three that the car driver was videoing. She was let out of the car and immediately mowed down. Luckily, two good Samaritans held her hand and stayed with her as she went on to heaven. Joining me is Maddie's mother, Ashley Bostert. Ashley, when you agreed to join us today, I know that you knew you would hear facts of her death and her treatment again. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what you're going through. I'm sorry to bring it all back up. But there are so many rape and homicide victims, families out there that you can inspire. How do you keep going forward when you are hearing these facts again? It's, it's very challenging, Nancy. Um, I focus on where she is right now, and that's where we all want to be, right? Um, our goal is, is to one day make it to heaven, and that is what I try to focus on, not the horrific, terrible things that happened that evening. Because um, if I do, it will make me sick and I will crawl up in a bed and not want to leave my bedroom. But I know that's not what Maddie would want. So I'm trying to live as well as I can. But I have my moments and sometimes I do crawl up in a bed. Mother's Day was hard. She made me a mother. 
we went to church, we went to lunch and I needed to cry and spend time alone. And that's what I did. So I take it day by day. How do you believe this has affected you raising your other children? I cherish every single moment. I go to every field trip. If all of their sports activities, I live at the baseball field. Um, even when it's challenging, which, you know, Nancy, being a mother is the greatest gift, but it's the hardest job that I've ever had too. But I embrace even the hard times where we're up till 10 o'clock doing a science project because I don't have that anymore with Maddie. All I have is the memories, but I do keep her alive. She is all over my home. We celebrate her birthday with a trip. We do things that she would like and we honor her every day. We carry her with us. I bet you think back on those memories all the time and smile, I do. but I want to apologize for putting you through this and you know you'll go through it again at trial. I've had moms and I would say, ma'am, you, you know you don't have to sit through this and without fail, they would say, no, I'm staying right here on the front row. I'm not leaving. Right. And here is Ashley Bostert again on the front row, still refusing to say a bad word about the judge. You're stronger than I am, Ashley, much stronger than me. Guys, what did we learn from the autopsy? According to WBRZ, Madison Brooks' leaked autopsy report shows Brooks' BAC as 0.282, 12% lower than the sheriff's office report of 0.319. While there was no sign of vaginal trauma, there were abrasions and bruising to Brooks' backside that the coroner noted were suspicious of sexual assault. DNA from KV in Washington was recovered in Brooks' genital area, but none of the four men's DNA was found inside Brooks. But there was their DNA around Maddie's genital area, their DNA. And I'm curious what type of DNA. Uh, not that it matters to me because the bruising and the indications on her, quote, backside, as they euphemistically call it, in the autopsy report tell me everything I need to know. Joining me right now, uh, renowned in his field, a domestic violence and sex assault expert, former sex detective in California, Bill Hernandez, joining us tonight out of Napa. Bill, thank you for being with us. Again, that segment of the autopsy tells me everything I need to know. Explain. Well, I mean, it's pretty clear that if she has those injuries to those areas, she was obviously sexually assaulted and with her BAC being as high as it was, there's no possible way that she could have consented to any of that. And then plus she was heard in the background on the video telling the person, telling the suspects no and to get off of her. So, I mean, it's clearly a rape. So the lack of DNA is not a, an issue that says there was no sex. It says there was no rape. It just means that there was no ejaculation. But it can also be argued the alternative interpretation of that is there was no sex. But I think with the video and all of that, that's, again, um, a moot point. They're saying that she was absolutely in control of saying yes to the sex and that it was consensual sex. Her blood alcohol content came back at 0.319. Now, in the beginning, I myself kept saying, okay, that's four times over the legal limit, but she was underage. So the legal limit for anyone underage is 0.02. Actually, she was 16 times over the legal limit. Law enforcement has also said there's no possible way that she could have consented to it, making it rape. Absolutely no way that she could give consent. And not only that, what about this bizarre video that these, let me just put it out there, a-holes took during the rapes, according to the state? Uh, of course, they have not been proven guilty at trial. They have not been proven guilty at trial, but they gave 
very detailed statements, very detailed statements about what had happened to Maddie. In fact, the ones in the front seat rotating into the back seat so they could also assault her. Take a listen to this. The videos that Case and Carver took the night of Maddie Brooks' alleged assault have resulted in more charges for the teen. A grand jury indicted Carver for video voyeurism in addition to the charge of principal to first and third degree rape. In one of the videos, Carver laughed and said they finna rape her before Brooks was assaulted. Those videos first given to WBRZ and WAFB by the defense, who, Kieran Shala, we were hearing you earlier, Emmy and Murrow award-winning investigative reporter at Unfiltered with Kieran. Kieran, I don't know how they think these videos are going to help them. What can you tell us about the videos? Well, the fact that there were additional charges just because the videos came out, there's one reason that sometimes releasing every single thing is not the best idea. I get it. The defense attorneys released this hoping to kind of show that, hey, um, Madison was asking for this. This has kind of been their defense this entire what, time. What? Wait, 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 what? Did I just hear the words? The defense theory is that Maddie asked for this? Well, because they're claiming, hey, she was, um, even though she was drinking, she wasn't to a point where she was raped. This was consensual. That's been the defense's defense this entire time. This was consensual. That was the reason for releasing these videos. Guys, take a listen to this. Now, over the course of the next hour, Maddie is either raped or has consensual sex with two of these young men. They take turns. One gets out of the vehicle while the other has sex with her or rapes her. Then they swap over. Now, while this happens, Hayson Carver, the driver, and the oldest defendant, his name is Everett Lee, they're in the two front seats of this vehicle. Okay, so how that's not rape, I don't know. Uh, Karen, how many of these defendants are actually charged with rape? So three of them are charged with rape itself, but Everett Lee, who was actually one of the uncles of one of the boys, he is charged with principal because he was right there. Now, I want to point out that the driver, he actually, through court, through the court documents, should I say, they're claiming that he did not actually rape her. However, he videoed it and he never stopped it. That's why his charges from the district attorney's office were upgraded to include rape. Guys, the fact that this judge has now been documented as representing, before she was a judge, her serial rapist son, and now letting one rapist go after the next, listen. Donald Link confesses to raping a woman at knife point, and he is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. After several appeals, the Louisiana State Supreme Court affirms Link's judgment a year later. In a second bid for a new trial, Link claims the jury's instructions were flawed, but the Supreme Court again confirms the trial was fair. This year, Link asked the court to consider amending his sentence to allow parole. Instead, Judge Gailhorn Ray overturned the rape conviction. I, 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 I don't even know what to say about that. Jared Ferentino, it's absolutely unheard of, and that's on appeal. So a guy who is a convicted rapist comes to her... And the request is that he be allowed to be considered for parole. Instead, she throws out, nobody even asked her to do this, even the defense. She throws out his whole case and he walks free right there, right there. Nobody asked her to do that. And she was blaming a jury charge, which is uh, everybody, a jury instruction is after the state and the defense give their closing arguments, the judge instructs the jury on the law by which they are to judge the case. In other words, the definition of homicide is X. The definition of rape is X. And they have to hear the law and it's got to be correct verbatim. That was not even an issue. She used that as a pretext to let a rapist go, Ferentino. I've never seen a case thrown out for a bad jury instruction by the judge at that level. If there was prosecutorial misconduct, if there was conduct that was beyond the pale, here's the best. They weren't even asking for that. The, the DA is in shock over that decision. 
they didn't go into court prepared to even combat that request. Right. The judge gave them a gift, which shows a pattern, which is that she has a bias toward rapists. I'm sorry. That's well, just the way it works. Hold on. I hope you're sitting down. Good. You may need to lay down for this, Ferentino. Listen, there is another case, DeAndre Cox. DeAndre Cox is accused of raping his preteen neighbor twice at gunpoint. Judge Gail Horn Ray sets Cox's bond at $150,000. Four days later, Ray lowers Cox's bond to $100,000 without a hearing. Cox is released the same day to house arrest at his grandmother's home, within 100 feet of the victim's residence, in violation of a protection order. At a hearing over the matter, Ray refused to increase the bond and ruled that Cox must now reside with his mother. The victim's mother says Cox's family has harassed her daughter ever since his release. The, the toxicology kit obviously shows the lack of consent because it was drug-facilitated sexual assault. So whether they admitted to doing it and she wanted it, they can admit that all day, but it wasn't consensual, but it was drug-facilitated. So either way, they knowingly facilitated it and it was done, it's there. And joining me in all-star panel to make sense of what we are learning today, if the, this judge stays on this case, it will be a huge travesty of justice. I know that Maddie's mother, Ashley Boaster, is refusing to comment on whether the judge should be thrown off the case or not. You're stronger than me, Ashley. There's no question about that. But Ashley, do you really believe in your wildest imaginations that your daughter would consent to have sex in the back seat of a car with three guys while another guy up front videoed it? Do you really think that happened? No, I know that didn't happen. It did not happen. That did not happen. And what about the fact that these perps gave detailed confessions about what happened that night. Listen. In the reports, the initial reports when they were all arrested were very detailed. And I remember that he did not want to be there and he didn't want to use his vehicle. But one of the main reasons that the district attorney actually upped his charge to first degree principal to first degree is because he did allow that and he didn't leave. Joining me, Bill Hernandez, uh, joining us out of Napa, sex assault detective in California. Bill, thank you for being with us. Detailed statements by the defendants. And you know, they were all like, it's his fault, it's his fault, and thereby damning themselves as well because one for all and all for one. Co-defendants in the car while this happened at the very best. Right. Yeah, they should be. They're all guilty of, of the charges that they're facing right now. I mean, they all knew what was going to happen. They talked about it. They they were video recording it. And she even said no. And they all had a principal and were actors in this rape. To Karen Chawla joining us, uh, award-winning investigative reporter who is a star of Unfiltered with Kieran. Karen, I just can't believe that the judge is not stepping down all on her own. What's her problem? I wish I could tell you that. It's interesting that we have cases coming up with judges, and it's not just her. There are other, ca other cases where we've covered with other judges in the same jurisdiction. This is the 19th JDC in Baton Rouge. That is East Baton Rouge Parish. They're not, they're not going to talk to the media because they claim, hey, it's an ongoing case, you can call their office, you usually get no comment, and then you're hung up on. Majority of the times, the district attorney is fighting these cases. If it's not with the First Circuit Court of Appeal, it's the Louisiana Supreme Court. And honestly, the last several cases, with some of these judges in our jurisdiction, they're just getting tossed out nonstop with the Louisiana Supreme Court overturning or reversing the charges back to the original, what it was, and instead where the judges are overturning cases or vacating in the case with Donald Link, that also is now being challenged with the Supreme Court. From what I understand, the video, and I don't know what kind of mind would choose to video this horrible sex assault on Maddie, but in the video, 
uh, it's very overwhelming. Video of them holding her down and yelling that they're going to rape her. I, I, I don't know what else is needed, but I do not trust this judge overseeing this case. Well, and especially, look, number one, you've already said it. Look at her son. She represented him, and now she's a judge over it. But then look at what she just did a few weeks ago with a guy who was serving life, and he did not even ask for what she gave him. She vacated his sentence. We've discussed this repeatedly that it's unheard of, and it's not just unheard of. They are, even our local district attorney, Hiller Moore, is just baffled by something with this, that he did not ask for a vacation, vacate. He asked to simply reduce the charge right. so he could actually be eligible for parole. So it, it just goes to show that it's almost like she has a soft corner for rapists. Her son is a convicted rapist. This Donald Link was a convicted rapist. They're not, it's not that they haven't gone to trial yet. So it's not a innocent until proven guilty. They've been proven guilty. I want to go to Ashley Boaster. This is Maddie's mother. Ashley, if you could speak out today to other family members, moms and dads all across our country, and to rape victims themselves, what are your words? What's your message? Cherish your babies. Cherish every single moment with them and teach your kids to be a leader, to step up for what's right. So many people could have intervened that night and none of this would have happened. Teach them to, if they see something, to do something, to be proactive. If things don't look right, help someone. Even if you don't know who they are, just be that leader, be the voice of action. Ashley Bostert, your mouth to God's ear. We stop and we remember American hero, police officer Jonah Oswald, Fairway, Kansas, just 29. Oswald shot and killed in the line of duty. He was a U.S. Army Reserve vet now survived by grieving wife Hannah and two beautiful children with a life sentence with no dad. American hero, Officer Jonah Oswald. I want to thank all of our guests, but especially to Maddie's mother, Ashley Bostert. But thank you to all of our guests and to you for being with us tonight and our new MSM family as we, in our own way, seek justice. Nancy Gray signing off. I'll see you tomorrow night, 6 and 9 o'clock sharp, Eastern, and until then, good night, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.